So good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Farhad Setna. I'm a private immigration attorney. My office is in Guyloga Falls, uh, and I've done this type of presentation for Akron U, for students, for goodness, I can't remember how many years. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Nick for having me here from UARF, as well as Robin Brown, as well as, of course, Emily Aronson, who's always interacted with me on these matters in the last several years since she's moved to Akron U. So I want to thank you all for being here, because it's something so important to me, as an entrepreneur myself, to talk to people like you, who want to be entrepreneurs at some point in time. All of you have a dream, and that's why you're here, and I applaud you for doing that. There's many hundreds of foreign students on this campus, but there's just a small room full of you here today, which tells you how wonderful it is and how rare you are and how incredible you are to be that spark, to have that spark, to come up here and want to learn and have a dream of starting your own business. So just by show of hands, how many of you are graduating this year or perhaps in May? Any of the foreign students graduated this year? In, okay, so you've got two hands coming up there, super. Uh, how many of you are in a master's program? Okay, one master's program. How many of you are in a PhD program? Okay, very good. And how many of you are in a bachelor's program? Excellent. Okay, so all of you have dreams, all of you have goals. My goal here today is to try to help you and give you some direction. I think Emily did a fantastic job with her presentation about what the basic framework is as far as regulations for OPT and for CPT. What's allowed under OPT, what's not allowed, what's allowed under CPT, what's not allowed. So let's jump into this a little bit more and go forward with that. The issue is going to be how do we operate as entrepreneurs, how do we operate within the law and not fall afoul of the USCIS regulations. So if we can get the slide to advance, <laughs> it will help. Am I doing something wrong here? No, I think we pull out the wrong version. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so excuse us for a moment while we deal with these technical difficulties. Okay. I think you may pull up the PDF version of the PDF. Yeah. Okay, all right. So in the meantime, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a private attorney. I graduated from Akron Law. Okay, almost, goodness, I hate to admit this, but it'll be 30 years next year, which is scary, okay? I'm old, all right? So I graduated from Akron Law about 30 years ago, and uh, I practiced law for a while with the law firm. After that, I set up my own practice since 1995. I've done exclusively immigration and small business since that time. And so I really enjoy working with entrepreneurs, students, people looking for work, H-1Bs, L-1s, E-1s, O-1s, all that alphabet soup of immigration law. <laughs> I also have an MBA, also from Akron U, because I did my joint JD MBA program. Anyone here in that type of program? MBA plus something else or MPA? Anyone doing a joint degree? Right now, no, not in this group. Okay, so it's been a great pleasure to be here at Akron U, and I love to do this every year um, because it, it's a way for me to give back to the University of Akron, which was also very good to me. So I'm happy that you are here as well. So let's try this now, shall we? Okay, everybody? Look at that, Nick. Okay, so here's a typical disclaimer, lawyer stuff. What am I saying? I'm saying basically that I am not giving you legal advice. I can't because I don't know the story of each and every one of you. I don't know what year you're in school. I don't know when you're exactly going to graduate. I don't know what your business is going to be. I don't know what your parameters are. I don't know how much money you have to invest. So I'm not giving you legal advice on your case. I'm giving you general advice on what the law tends to say and tends to hold. If you need more assistance, contact Emily or contact me. At the end of this presentation, there will be a slide which has my name and phone number on it. Before you leave, I'm going to give you my business card. Before you leave, I'm also going to give you this beautiful, absolutely smashing, lovely, blue-colored pen, which has a stylus at the end of it, so you can actually type my name into your, into your phone right now before you leave, okay? So, 
That's my plan is to achieve as much as I can here today in a general sense to give you some direction. So what are we going to talk about today? We've already heard about the regulations, CPT, OPT. Uh, we've talked about STEM majors. Is it possible to get multiple CPT and OPT? Yes, indeed it is. You get a second set of CPT and OPT for every major, every degree, excuse me, that you advance to as long as it's a degree at a higher level. So you get one set of CPT, OPT for a bachelor's. You get a second set of CPT, OPT for a master's. You get a third set of CPT, OPT for a PhD. And if you're in a STEM major, that means you can get up to nine years of OPT, okay, and all the degrees. You could be 50 years old before you even have to worry about getting an H1B. <laughs> okay? If you're really careful and planned out really well, for example, if you take, you know, seven or eight years to do your MBA like I did, okay, you get even more time. All right? Law school is a different thing altogether. I was on the five-year plan. Everyone else took three years. I did five. Okay? So you have a way, in a sense, in essence of of getting, building more time if you need that time, if you stack your cards properly under the current regulations. Okay, volunteering, we're going to talk about that. Volunteering during CPT, probably not possible. Okay, volunteering during OPT, very much possible. We're going to talk about that. Volunteering during your STEM OPT extension, not allowed. Unemployment during your OPT, as well as your STEM OPT extension. There's some small period of time where you're allowed to be unemployed during both the STEM, uh, during both the initial OPT of one year, as well as your STEM OPT extension of two years. And, and we will talk about that very briefly. So once again, to recap, under CPT, curricular practical training, volunteering is not allowed. Under OPT, Volunteering is allowed. Now there are two types of OPT. There's pre-completion OPT, correct? And there's post-completion OPT. And together, and again I differ all the time to my colleague Emily, again, together they cannot exceed 12 months, right? They cannot. So if you take okay. your pre-completion OPT. Correct. You cannot they cannot together exceed 12 months, right? Okay. So in pre-completion OPT, it's a little bit of a question whether you can volunteer or not because you've got to again present to the OIP a potential employer where you're going to be working so whether or not you can volunteer in pre-completion OPT I think is a gray area would you agree with me Emily on that I think you can where you want to work for pre-completion OPT so what our experts are saying here from the OIP is you can work during pre-completion OPT, which is great because we're going to weave some of that into my discussion with you here today as well. Okay, let's talk about volunteering. What's volunteering? For who? If you're going to go out of school, you've got your degree, it's pre-completion or post-completion, you're volunteering for a company that's already set up, that's great. They've already got it set up, you go, you volunteer. Okay, when you volunteer for that company, you don't have to set up a business, you don't have to do any of the things that the law requires to do as if you were an entrepreneur. You're not an entrepreneur, you're just going and volunteering for somebody else. So that's perfectly fine. Volunteering, however, remember, must be in your area of education, otherwise it's unauthorized employment. And ladies and gentlemen, all of these slides are going to be up on my website once we're done. I believe uh, Robin is going to put them on the OIP website as well. So you should not have to write down all this, okay? Just listen, assimilate, and write down, most importantly, any questions you might have so I can answer those questions at the end, okay? All right. For the entrepreneur, so there's two types of students here, okay? One of you has a STEM major. The other does not. How does the OPT regulation treat each student? Well, the first difference, of course, is the non-STEM student gets only 12 months of OPT. 12 months of OPT, two month grace period, and they've got to leave the US if they haven't secured a job, haven't secured an H1, or are not going back to school. So that's where, essentially, the music stops, and they've got to go home. Okay, STEM majors, of course, you get to get another two years of OPT 
provided you're going to work for a company that's registered for E-Verify and you have completed the training form I-893. If you do those things and you're in a valid employment situation, then you get your extra 24 months of OPT and the Office of International Programs will issue you a new I-20, you'll be re-entered in CBIS and so on, and you'll go about your merry way with your STEM OPT extension. All right. Caution. During the STEM OPT extension, that is in the 24 months after the first year of OPT, the student cannot volunteer. It must be a paid position. So OPT allows you in that first critical year, 12 months, you get to volunteer. You get to essentially set up a business and be self-employed and start up that process. That's only for that first year. When you're in your STEM OPD extension, you must be employed. There's no getting around that. I'll hold all of your questions till the end, if you don't mind, just because that way everybody can get assimilated with it. And you never know, I might have some glimmering of intelligence and answer your question before you raise it, okay? okay. <laughs> all right. So the next issue is not so fast. Is there a problem even with that scenario? What do you do as an interning and entrepreneur? How can you achieve your goals within the framework of these rules? What are we going to see? How are we going to explore this issue and get you to a place where you're safe? That's very important. Safe from the immigration perspective. That's number one. Number two, how are you going to achieve your goals even while you're safe? Safety from an immigration perspective, following the law is of course important. But by the same token, we don't want our hands to be tied by the regulations and by the laws. So we end up doing nothing. Correct? That's why you're here today. All right. So first of all, remember my disclaimer. This is only general legal advice. Number two, after we're done in a couple of days, this will all be uploaded to my website. So you'll have the presentation once again to look at. You don't have to memorize everything I'm saying today. You don't have to write down everything I'm saying today. Just keep this in mind. Key point. Here's the main issue that we have with you today. And that is the word of employment. If you want to be self-employed, if you want to start your own business, that is fine as we said in the first year. But you cannot be open quotes, close quotes, self-employed in that subsequent time on your STEM OPT. So even if you set up your business in the first 12 months, can you be self-employed, i.e. can that business hire you in the subsequent 24 months? That's a question we're gonna talk about. Generally, generally now these are the rules if you carry on a business as a sole proprietor meaning you yourself that's it the business is you or as an independent contractor once again that's you yourself you're great at accounting you say i'm going to be a freelance accountant going to businesses assisting them with their accounting issues helping them set up quickbooks for example all that is great for that first year the moment you get on to your OPT extension, and that's going to be that was a bad example because accountants won't get a STEM OPT. Let's assume that you are in the field of life sciences and you're a very good food scientist. And you say, I'm going to set up my own business as a food scientist, helping food processing industries meet safety regulations. Okay? You're applying your food sciences degree. First year is fine. You're self-employed, you have that business going. STEM OPT extension becomes a problem because unless you have a your own company and make, and we talk about this in a minute, unless you have your own company and you're not essentially a sole proprietor working for yourself, you will run afoul of immigration regulations because then you will be self-employed. So in the first year of OPT, Self-employment may be okay, but second year, subsequent years becomes a problem. 
because then you're not supposed to be self-employed. What's self-employment? You're a sole proprietor or an independent contractor, or you're a member of a partnership that carries on a trade or business, or you are otherwise in business for yourself, including a part-time business. Now, these are immigration, these are immigration regulations, these are internal revenue service or tax department regulations. But nevertheless, those are the kind of regulations the immigration service is going to look at to determine whether you are employed, self-employed, working for someone else. So keep these guidelines in mind. In general, steer away from being employed. It's because if you're employed, if you're employed, the issue is going to be, are you employed as being self-employed? you're self-employed, it's a no-no in your STEM OPT period. Okay, so what's employment? How do we define it? What are some of the cases that came out of this? Okay, employment is a person usually below the executive level who is hired by another to perform a service, especially for wages or salary, and is under the other and is under the other person's control. That's the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of employment. You're hired by another to perform a service for wages or salary and you are under somebody else's control. Four elements there in that definition. Another definition is who controls the worker? Who is in charge of control? If the relationship between the worker and business is that the business controls the worker, it typically means there is employment. If the business ex, uh, exerts financial control, meaning yes, we're going to pay you, or we are going to give you a bonus, or we're going to fund your work, then it ex ex exercises financial control as well. So control can be two types, behavioral control, meaning we're telling you what to do, or it could be financial control, meaning we're holding the purse, we're holding the wallet, and we're controlling you through that. So employment, ladies and gentlemen, can be quite insidious. What you think doesn't look like employment on its face could be employment under one of these very insidious and burdensome definitions. Some other aspects to determine employment are relationship. So we had financial control, uh, behavioral control. We also have a relationship. What are some of the aspects that go into whether someone is an employee or not under relationship? Whether the business provides the worker with employee type benefits such as insurance, a pension plan, vacation or sick pay. The permanency of the relationship, the extent to which the services performed by the worker are a key aspect of the regular business of the company. So if you are performing, let's say going back to my earlier example, a food sciences person and you're checking the processing line every day, three times a day during your shift to make sure that you're meeting the standards. That's something the business needs to do every day. It's part of the regular operation of the business, correct? Okay, that would be a key aspect. If it's a key aspect, most likely it is employment, all right? Finally, the extent to which the worker has unreimbursed business expenses. So if the worker has business expenses, that he's not getting paid or she's not getting paid back from anybody, probably not an employment situation. But if the worker's regular business expenses are being repaid to the worker by the company, then most likely that worker is an employee because he or she is billing back to the company and getting paid. Now, there may be instances where you can be an independent contractor and bill back to the company as well. So there may be some, some leeway with regard to that last point. Once again, this didn't come from the Immigration Service or Department of Homeland Security. This came from irs.gov. Okay? Okay. Case law is just as important. Most of the case law that I've identified relates to whether the workers getting paid or not. That seems to be where the courts are headed. If you get paid, you're an employee. If you get a W-2, you're an employee. If you get a salary every two weeks, you're an employee. If you get a wage or check every two weeks, you're an employee. If not, you're not an employee. 
So the evergreen case that's been there for a long time is called Matter of Hira. Matter of Hira is a very interesting case. In Matter of Hira, an individual came to the United States as a B-1 visitor for business. This was in the 1960s. And what did Hira do? Hira's his name. Hira went from city to city and measured people, primarily men, for business suits. And Hira sent those measurements back to Hong Kong for the suits to be made and sent to the United States. And the immigration service, <coughs> excuse me, at that time said, Hira is doing business in this country. He is employed in this country. He is a B1 business visitor. He can't be employed. And the Board of Immigration Appeals and the Attorney General at that time overruled the Immigration Service and said, no, Hira is not employed in this country. He is merely an independent contractor collecting measurements for suits for his employer who is in Hong Kong. He's sending the measurements back to Hong Kong. He doesn't get a salary in the USA. Hira's salary was sent to his parents in India. He gets a nominal living expense for being in the US. And other than that, all his expenses are paid for by his employer in Hong Kong. So he is not, quote unquote, working or employed in the USA. That's a great case. And even though it's a case from 1966, it still holds true today. I teach it in my immigration law class at Akron Law. The existence, second case is Bryson versus Middlefield. The existence is relevant when an employee is paid, is relevant to the fact of whether an employee is actually an employee or is not an employee. Compensation is a factor to be considered in determining whether a person is an employee. In Yampas v. Mini Lab Circuits, we have only employees, who, only individuals, excuse me, who receive compensation can be deemed employees. <clears throat> In O'Connor v. Davis, where there is no financial benefit, no plausible employment relationship of any sort can be said to exist. Why am I saying this to you? Why am I saying don't get paid? Because if you set up, for example, in the first year itself, quote unquote, a company, and you're quote unquote volunteering from that for that company. You can't be a volunteer and get paid at the same time. So you've got to be careful about whether you become an employee. Because if you become an employee, then potentially are you then going to run afoul of the immigration regulations? Okay? In the next case, Avistola, a jury must decide to whether non-monetary benefits were sufficient to make an employee not a volunteer. Compensation in exchange for services is central to an employment relationship. That's in the Graves versus Women's Professional Rodeo Association. Quite an interesting occupation, okay? <laughs> Keller versus Nisayuna Consolidated Fire District. Commissioners who, didn't, who were unpaid, received no benefits, were not employees. Fire districts, firefighters who received neither wages nor any indirect financial consideration were not employees either. So if you don't get money, essentially you're not employed. So what's employment? Someone who is hired by someone else or other legal entity to perform work or provide services for money, who does not have much control over what he or she does, cannot chart his, his or her independent course to accomplish the tasks that have to be done. You've got to do this, you've got to do it. End of story. And may receive other benefits for his or her work. So you may not get paid a whole lot, but if you get other benefits, potentially, does that classify you as an employee? Maybe yes. Okay. So here's the next question. And I'm trying to work this out uh, as far as giving you guidance. We have a couple of you graduating this year. We've got some others graduating possibly next year. The issue is, do we just sit and wait and wait and wait until we graduate and then we can do these things? Or can we do some things to get the process started before we graduate? If you are still a student, you're not 
graduated yet? Can we do some things and not run afoul of the regulations? And my answer to you is, yes, you can. What can you do? You can research your field. What opportunities are there? What business opportunities are there? Okay, make contacts within the industry. Sure you can. It's no harm in saying, hey, I'm a foreign student at Akron U. I like this work. Can I spend an hour with you and learn about your business? That's perfectly fine. It's perfectly legal. You're not getting paid. You're not even volunteering. You're just having a meeting with a person. There's no law that says you can't do that. Okay? Discuss possible business opportunities. In the course of your research, in the course of your meetings, you can, of course, you're going to find out what can be done better in this field. What opportunities are in this field? Are there opportunities in this field? That's another question that you're going to ask. Maybe you find out, yeah, there's great opportunity, or there's no opportunity, or there's not enough opportunity. That will tell you whether or not you want to set up a company or a business in that particular field. Finally, conduct market research. What are your prospective clients looking for? Is there an unfulfilled need, or is there a need you can fulfill better? I put that last, and I also have that at the first. Why? Because your field is huge. Your major is huge. I'm sure there's a lot of different subsections there. Within that, as you talk to people, you do more research, you discuss possible business opportunities, you'll be able to tune it down. What am I going to do in the field of XYZ? How can I fine tune it down, find that little niche which companies are going to come to me, individuals are going to come to me and say, we need this service or we need this product. Okay, the biggest no-no for immigration anyway, is don't make any money from your business. If, if these three things haven't happened, and before you graduate, before you set up your business, before you receive your EAD card, don't make any money from your business. For you to make money from your business, please get these three things first. Okay, I don't feel comfortable recommending to you start your business on your uh, pre-completion OPT. I know you can volunteer, but starting your business, getting money is an issue. Why? Because sometimes when you get money, people pay you money, it could be you receive that money after your semester has begun again at the school. And you're a student, you're in class full time. You're not in the summertime, you're not doing, your, you're not doing that work during your pre-completion OPT time. You're getting the money during the time when you're supposed to be a full-time student in class. Could that be an issue for immigration to bring up and say, aha, you violated the regulation? It's possible. So I don't recommend any overlap between your business activity and your student activity. Am I making sense so far? I'm being very cautious. I'm putting myself in your shoes because I was once an international student myself. And you remember how careful I used to be. And this is well before 9-11. This is well before all the huge regulations that came out. Even at that time, I was careful. And today, we have to be 10 times more careful. Okay? So I'm being extremely cautious. All right. So as soon as you graduate, what can you do? In my opinion, as soon as you graduate, you can do at least these things. Incorporate your business, register it with the Secretary of State, determine the business type, LLC, C Corporation, S Corporation, partnership, etc. You don't want to be self-employed. You don't want to be a sole proprietor. Because that leads to what? Allegation that you are employed. Okay, you don't want to be a sole proprietor. Also, there's another issue, liability. If you're a sole proprietor, and you mess up, someone can sue you personally and you will be personally responsible for whatever debt that person is able to get from a court order. So if, if you mess up on a job, a task, and the court decides, okay, the damage to your client was $10,000 and you're a sole proprietor, guess what? You've got to find the $10,000 in your assets and pay the person who was harmed by your improper or incorrect behavior or service, okay? 
so ex, ex, uh, so creating a corporation or a company to shield you from liability is a critical issue that's why i say point number one in corporate or business point number two get a taxpayer identification number what is that that's something that you get from the internal revenue service and you want that number why do you want that number because if you have that number that's like a separate number for your business just as you have a social security number identifying yourself you have a tax id number which identifies your business very important because you're going to need that number to do things like setting up a bank account deposit accounts uh, any uh, business dealing that you do you do the name of the company not yourself so you want to have a separate entity all together with its own taxpayer ID number and you're going to use that business to set up your own separate segregated bank accounts don't mix your money with the company's money the initial payment you may be giving that company let's say ten thousand dollars for its initial expenses that's your investment put that into that bank account that becomes the company's money don't be taking money out of it to pay for groceries don't be taking money out of it to pay for car insurance okay you keep that separately finally if your business needs a business license let's say you're going to set up some of a ethnic restaurant you definitely need a food service license get licenses that you need be careful of sensitive areas either intellectual property or national security issues be careful of those issues many of you are stem students you may have uh, scientific issues that you're exposed to or that you're working with which may pose specific and unique areas of interest for the government in terms of national security or in terms of intellectual property so be careful of those things consult an attorney for details on those issues okay a word about non-profits some of you may have a great idea to change the world the same rules apply for non-profits as well now most likely most likely i don't know how this will work out with the non-profit you're going to set up your own business you're going to set up a, a, a it's in, in essence an entity that's separate from you that's always the case it will be an entity that's going to be a, a, a tax perhaps a, a tax exempt entity for that you have to approach the internal revenue service and get your special tax code exemption as well if you're a non-profit so consequently a lot more goes into a non-profit on the front end which is setting up the company in order to be a non-profit not only do you set up with the Secretary of State, you also have to set up with the Internal Revenue Service in order to get your tax exempt status and be eligible to take collect loans, grants, whatever, in order to continue the operation of your entity. Okay? Uh, is it possible, however, to create and grow a self-funding, self-service nonprofit within one year? And why do I say one year? Because that's your 12 months of initial OPT intellectual property issues we talked about that a moment ago protect yourself if it's your idea then patent it or trademark it if it's a trade secret then make sure you keep it secret patenting is very expensive so unless you have some absolutely fantastic idea that you can get some investors involved in who can support you sponsor you or sell your idea to them it's going to be very hard for you as an entrepreneur as an individual to be able to patent it unless you have deep pockets you've got a lot of money you've got someone who can help you family friends whatever if it's trade secret make sure you keep it secret if it's a trade secret you can't reveal it to people there's no secret in that case <laughs> sometimes you don't patent things you just keep them as trade secrets a classic example of difference is this think of coca-cola there is no patent for coca-cola why because if someone looks at that patent it's public record they could duplicate coca-cola exactly there's no patent for Coca-Cola. You will never find it. Coke has that secret. It's a trade secret. Only Coke knows it. It's one of the most closely guarded trade secrets throughout history. But it's a trade secret. It's not a patent. And they don't have to pay a penny for patenting. Why? Because it's locked up in some safe somewhere in Coke's vast global empire. Okay? All right. Draft employee secrecy agreements and IP ownership agreements. Have employees sign them up front 
at the time of hire, not later. So if you're in that situation where you're starting to hire staff, people need to sign these agreements up front so they don't take your trade secrets or their research and go somewhere else. And then make sure you don't infringe on other people's IP either. All of you have probably read about the court battles between Samsung and Apple, right? Samsung copying Apple's products and ideas and, and, and Samsung says, I'm not doing it. Apple says, yes, you are. Well, they've got millions of dollars to spend on litigation. <laughs> I don't know if you want to be in that situation at this point in time in your careers. So keep that in mind, respect other people's IP. Okay, so what do you do in your first OPT year? You can volunteer for your business. Remember, you can only volunteer if it's in the same field as your US degree major. You can set up a business, you can volunteer for it. The business does not, does not have to pay you a penny. You can volunteer for that business. What do you do in that first year? Legally, openly, you can do this and you're not unemployed because who's hiring you? Your business is hiring you. So you're not that unemployment problem that you have if you're completely unable to find your own job and you've got to then stop your OPT and you've got to leave the country. That doesn't happen. Your own business hired you. So grow your business at first year, make contacts, have sales, have revenue, try to get a staff. You're not paying yourself a salary, so every penny that your company makes hopefully goes back into the operation of that company to try to grow the company. Maybe build up a little, re <coughs> little reserve of funding to pay a salary down the road. Okay, why the first 12 months will be so important? Because if you're not in a STEM major, that 12 months <coughs> is all you're going to get. If you are in a STEM major, you'll be allowed to volunteer in the first 12 months. The first 12 months is all you have to volunteer to grow your business. After that 12 months is over, that business must be able to hire you because you cannot volunteer after the first 12 months. You can't do that. So keep that in mind. That first 12 months is so critical. Okay. What do you do? You're very kind, sir. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you so much. <clears throat> what do you do after the first 12 months of OPT? This is the difficult part. Ladies and gentlemen, you are here to set up your own businesses. I hope that you can do this. You're going to do a lot of work front-loaded before you even graduate because you want to take absolute maximum advantage of that 12 months of OPT. You have to, because that's the only time you're allowed to volunteer. So what do you do after the first 12 months of OPT? It depends on the following questions. Can the business afford to pay you a salary? Because if it can, you can maybe go on a work authorized status. Do you have staff? Do you have an established office? Because if you have a salary, and it doesn't have to be an H1B level salary, it can be some salary because under OPT rules, as you know, there's no base minimum of salary. So you can get paid a salary that way, you are not unemployed and you're not volunteering. Okay, so we're trying to, we're trying here to achieve some cushion, some financial cushion in that first year itself and have enough revenues coming in to be able to pay you a salary. Do you have staff? Why staff? Because if you have staff, it lends more legitimacy to your business that you're not quote unquote a one-man business, a one-man entity, you actually have staff, someone to answer the phone, someone to uh, do some of the press work that you need to do as part of whatever service you're offering, things of that sort. So you have to have, you have to have someone to support you. If you have someone to support, you can show, well, I've got two people on the payroll, it lends much more credibility to the business to say, yes, we've got someone here who is actually doing all the support work that's needed for the for the for the task to go on do you have an established office very important in my opinion to have an established office why because again it lends credibility to the business i'm using a lot of information i've learned over the years from doing applications for startup l1 companies for example or startup e2 investor visa companies these are the kind of factors that the immigration service looks at when it's approving L1 visas or E visas. And so the same factors could be applied even in a student OPT employment context. Okay, 
If the answer to all of these is yes, maybe the option is after your first, uh, after your three years under STEM OPT, you let the company hire you. What if you only had one year? You're not a STEM student. In that one year, you've got to build up enough that the company can hire you the following year. You've got to have these things. And that's that one year. That may be very hard for people who are not STEM students. It's possible, but it may be very hard. We'll talk about some other options. Okay, what are the H1B limitations? There's a restriction on the number of H1Bs. What's that restriction? 20,000 plus an additional 65,000. The 20,000 relates to US issued masters or higher degrees. 65,000 is to any degree from anywhere in the world, including US issued masters or higher degrees as well. So US issued masters or higher degrees get two bites of the apple. Bachelor's degree holders get stuck only in that 65,000, whether or not they're from the US or from anywhere else. The Department of Labor imposed salary is typically high. It's going to be higher than what your typical startup is going to be able to afford. Finally, there's H-1B dependent rules and, and, and restrictive USCIS attitudes right now because the administration frowns upon H-1Bs. In fact, H-1Bs are a visa category that the administration has specifically said, has instructed, needs to be scrutinized very highly. So the H-1B is a, is a problematic visa, but necessary if you have no other options. What other options do we have? You have an investor visa. It's limited, however, to countries which have a qualifying investment tr treaty with the USA. And the investor will have to show proof of the ongoing business in order to get an extension of the E2 business investor visa. And countries, not all countries, have a treaty of friendship, commerce, and navigation which allows for an investor visa with the USA. So some countries do, some countries don't. You've got to check the list of countries to see if your country is on that list the intra-company option or inter-company option. What does that mean? If you have a company overseas that your family owns or that you started or that you worked for before you came to the U.S. to study and that company has a branch in the U.S. or wants to open a branch in the U.S., you could open that branch for them as a new business or you could transfer to that branch and work for that company in the USA. That may need you to uh, make some investments or that may need you to work differently with them or if it's a case of a new startup office in the USA. That's something you could do in that first year of OPT. All right? And essentially, the main rub there, the main rub that I've seen is that you must have been employed in that overseas company or affiliate for one year in the prior three years. Now, if you've already been a student here in a master's degree, you've been here for four years, it's highly unlikely that you worked in that company for one year of the prior three years. But if you're here for a master's program and you've been here only in two years, it's possible you could have had some work experience with them for the one year before you came to the USA. And you may have gone back home for the summertime and worked another three months, four months, six months collectively during that three year period. So that is the key, the key issue there that I see with clients. People want to come in as L1s, but they can't do it because they haven't worked for a minimum of at least one year in the previous three years. It must be a related or affiliated company. It can be family owned, need not be in the same line of business or industry. This is critical. So your field, let's say going back to my food science example, is in food science. Back home, your parents' company, your family business, is a textile industry business. Can you open a food science company in the USA as an affiliate to that textile industry business? Absolutely. Yes, you can. If they're the investors and they want to open up a company in the USA and that's in food science and that company wants to hire you, absolutely you can. Absolutely you can. What have you got to show? that you have enough money to open the company, that you've got staff for the company, and that you've got a premises, a location for the company. Those are critical. That's what my L1B, L1A, L1B practice is always dealing with those issues when it comes to clients who want to set up a intercompany transfer. The categories are, you can either be a manager, executive of that company, or you possess specialized knowledge 
to make you a unique and valued employee for that particular company. So that's the L1A or L1B options. L1A for manager, executive, L1B for specialized knowledge. Okay. Helpful resources. Right here at Akron U. And Nick told me about this and I was amazed. I did not know about this until a couple of days ago. But it's fantastic. It's called i -Corps. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. All of you who are interning entrepreneurs right here, I highly recommend this summer, talk to Nick, attend this seven week course. It's only two hours each week. Mm -hmm. four, uh, four weeks in the summer, so even better. Four weeks in the summer, so even better. So will that mean it will that mean it will be like four hours each week and then two hours for the end? Okay. So you still have a total of 14 hours that you have to attend, correct? Okay. Attend this class. It's gonna give you some good insights into what your business can do, how to set it up, whether your plan is even viable to start with. So I think that's very, very important. Am I summarizing that correctly, Nick? Thank you. So please talk to Nick later and sign up for this incredibly valuable resource, which is free. Is it right, sir? Yes. Free. Beautiful word, isn't it? Okay. All right. Now, this could be you. Maybe in 10 years, I'll be giving this program right here at Akron U, and someone will walk in the door with a beautiful three-piece suit and say, you remember? Remember, Mr. Sethna, you talked to me 10 years ago, and I have no clue who you are. He said, oh, I'm the newest billionaire right here in Akron, Ohio. This could be you, okay? An alien who came from overseas, sometimes with nothing but $20 in his or her pocket and a dream. Because isn't this a great country? It's a wonderful country, right? Okay, and we all have dreams, and America lets us dream, and more importantly, America gives us the tools to make those dreams happen. That's the beauty of this country. This is me. Contact me if you need to. If you have any questions, contact my office, set up a consultation, I'll be happy to help you. It's now 10 minutes past 12. Nick had instructed that's exactly when I need to stop. So I've stopped, and now we're ready for questions. So uh, Emily can answer questions, I can answer questions, and I'd ask Emily to come up here and sit with me so that we can uh, answer questions from anyone in the audience. And with your permission, Nick, how do we turn off the, the little... While Nick is doing that, let me just go around and hand out some of my business cards so that you have them, please. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the OPT and the CPT. Uh -huh. We have something on campus called the SEGA, where it's a graduate assistantship paid by a company right. to support a grad student. But how does that program relate to the OPT and the CPT? Is it separate from those? Or is it, um, So the SEGA, the Community Industrial um, Graduate Assistantship. Uh, there, that's gone back and forth the last several years, but um, it's finally it was finally concluded that that's considered on campus employment. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so that, that stays clear of the difficulties that you mentioned on yeah, right. CPT and LPT. Okay. Um, I don't know if that has any relevance to the entrepreneurship idea because these are students that, because of a con like a contract, I guess, with employers, these are students that. Um, our graduate assistants are paid by the University of Akron, but work off campus and employers. Um, so I, I don't know if that would, uh, how much that would be relevant to entrepreneurship, but. Um, well, in this case, we have a startup company, of which the student in question was integral in developing the, the materials for the company to research. And in fact, the company now actually has some money and, and can look forward to Hiring a student through that person. Okay, so through hiring a student through maybe CPT or OPT or the SEGA? Yeah, well, initially the SEGA, and then after graduation, potentially one of the others, depending on how it goes at that point. Yeah, um, are you talking about a second student that, like your company hiring, hiring a different student or your? It was the, the same one. Oh, okay, because I okay. initially the same one, and then. Uh, what happens after graduation remains to be seen. That's future stuff. Anyway. So, um, 
So I'm not sure if the what the question is right now. Oh, I think you you answered. Oh, okay. Well. Yes, yeah. SIGA is considered on campus employment. That's a great. That's a great program. Then in that case, so it's a wonderful template for other students to use as well. And in that case, you're kind of extending your your uh, OPT a great deal to while you're still a student. You start up this company. You are technically not employed by the company, but you're really funding your own employment, aren't you? That's a brilliant idea. Congratulations. Yes. Um, so during OPT, can you be employed by an external company and also work on starting your own company, or can it just be one or the other? Well, there's no requirement that says in this regulation that you can't do something that is in your own self-interest. In fact, the regulations clearly say, in the technical regulation, but the guidance clearly says that self-employment is possible. Okay, so you can be hired by a company X, mm -hmm. and you can still do all these other things that you're doing to set up a business. As I said, the only requirement is at some point in time that one year is going to be over. At the end of the one year, what are you going to be doing? Mm -hmm. That's the key at that point in time. Yeah, there's no nothing that says you can't be uh, hired by a company and doing an extra job at the same time. And then, is that something you have to report then? So, and like, so say we get like a, like I have an appointment with Johnson Johnson right now. So, for instance, if I do that for my OPT. Does that mean if I'm starting my own business as well, I have to report that to the immigration service? I absolutely would report in your okay. because technically you're still on OPT. Mm -hmm. On OPT you have to report all employment, but I wouldn't report it until you had that business set up okay. and until you were actually volunteering for that business. Okay. Then I would report it because then clearly it's quote unquote mm -hmm. employment. Right. It's volunteer employment, but it's still employment, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to report that. Okay. And following up that question, could we even, if we start making money with our business, um, then we will have two, two ways of getting money. Is that possible with OPT? Two ways meaning one from the court and for regular job with the regular company, mm -hmm. and then one from your own company that you've set up. Why not? It's still employment. Okay. And, your, and see, under the beauty of OPT, is that unlike the H-1B where you have certain defined levels of wages that you have to be paid, I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a salary scale basically for every employment and every opportunity in every part of the country, there's actually a wage level. For a software engineer, for example, in Cleveland, it may be very different for a software engineer in Silicon Valley, but there is a wage level. Those wage levels are very high. But for CPT, OPT, they don't have to meet those wage levels. So you could pay yourself some reasonable salary or reasonable remuneration for setting up your own business. But uh, keep in mind, here's one of the things about your own self-employment. If your company A, for which you have the 12 months of OPT or whatever, is not going to hire you down the road as an H1B, okay, you may be better off saving that money instead of paying yourself and saving as much money as you can so you can fund your own company, so when the 12 months is over, you have a nice cash reserve to either hire staff or you know do all those other things that can then result in your company being your primary employer and hiring you. You see? Because again, under OPD, there's no requirement for a minimum wage, right? You're not under the H-1B rules. So you could be hired possibly at thousands less than what the H-1B requires. But you still got to have those thousands because if, if the USCI says, show us your pay stubs, you've got to have pay stubs, right? And you've got to live on something, correct? Okay, so keep that in mind. Don't go running out and spend all your money at one time is what I'm trying to say. I actually have a question. Um, when you were presenting, you were talking about, I guess, employment, volunteering, and the biggest part is of course, being compensated for the service that you're providing. Um, when you're meeting with your clients about all this, would U.S. labor law come into the picture in any way? Because for us, that's kind of part of the equation when we're talking about volunteering. For right. Students. Right. You know, the way I look at it is I'm looking at it purely right now through the prism of immigration. And I'm not considering 
labor law and volunteering as much as I'm considering more the purpose of immigration, keeping students in legal status. There's also tax ramifications that come into play. Okay, because many times people are volunteers, they're not obviously not receiving any income, there's no taxation. There's also tax ramifications in terms of what's the definition of employment. And we saw a lot of that in the slides that I presented earlier. So my answer is this. My thought is that if you're volunteering within an organization that's already been set up, okay, that may perhaps cause an issue if you have an employee who's disgruntled and says, hey, why are you hiring a volunteer to do this job and not paying an actual US employee? There is law that says if you volunteer someone who is filling an actual job that exists, then you ought to be paying that person. So that is, I think, where you're getting at, right? right. So that is an issue. But if you're setting up your own company and you're volunteering for that own company, where's the aggrieved party? You're not taking a job away from a US worker. You're not failing to pay a US worker. You're failing to pay yourself. Are you, is it okay for you to, not to pay yourself? Absolutely it's okay not to pay yourself. Half the startups in this country wouldn't be existing today if their founders had to take all the money out of it right away. Correct? So that's, that's something that you can do very well if you are making your own company up. Furthermore, as I said earlier, if you're going to start up a non-profit, and I know that this your mind the back is a tremendously wonderful idea to help people in her own in her own country. You start a nonprofit, get yourself a nonprofit status from the Internal Revenue Service. Because that will further help you avoid paying some taxes and may help you build up your cash cushion or your reserves even more. Does that answer your question, sir? Okay. Any other questions? Sir? <coughs> So let's say I am an entrepreneur and a student, and I'm in the middle of the volunteer Let's say you will be. Right. <laughs> OK, good. And I'm in my volunteer period. OK. But on LinkedIn, which I've established to make business contacts, I list myself as CEO. Does that run afoul of the volunteer item? Well, even a CEO can volunteer. There's no rule that says you've got to be uh, you know, the mail clerk to volunteer. In fact, I would argue that the mail clerk actually should be getting paid. But yeah, you're the CEO, you're fine. You can you can do that. So have you already set up your company, sir? I work for UARF, I was asking. I'll be happy to meet you. Okay, if you had if you had done that. Okay, super. That's a good question. Yeah. But again, like I said earlier in my slides, I err on the side of caution because I like to protect our international students and the way the law is today and the way the regulations are and the way the Department of Homeland Security operates. You're better to be cautious rather than be brash. And I think that you're better off not starting your own company and incorporating till the day you get your C, your your EAD card in the mail. That's my that's my feeling. I, someone else might disagree and say you're too cautious. I work with clients every day and I see the messes that people can get into and I see how inflexible the Department of Homeland Security has become in recent years. And I don't want any of you to be walking into my office with that problem. Okay. So you're saying to register the company um, after you get the EAD on the Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Because that way, I mean, the EHS can't say, you were quote unquote working or you started doing things and even being self-employed before you even had the right to be self-employed. Because mm -hmm. self-employment is allowed. But when does that start? And I would say you can't start till you get your EAD because otherwise, have you conceivably done unauthorized employment? Yes, you have. Now, could you skate that, skate that surface and say, I didn't get a penny before I got my EAD card. But what if you've conducted all the activities that led you to getting paid and you just deferred your payment till you got the EAD card? Haven't you been employed during that time? And then that's a possible self-employment and possibly a no-no, correct? So I am being extremely cautious, ladies and gentlemen. And you may afford me for that, and that's your right to afford me. But I'm looking out for one person, and that's you. Okay? Does that make sense? That's my philosophy on it anyway. Okay? Any other questions? So my major is international business. Fantastic. So 
Um, I was thinking, so we always see that to start our own business, you gotta be in our field of study. However, my field of study international business, which is one of the most broad field of study. So does that make me kind of not as restricted in that way? You know, I think you're a very smart woman and you've already <laughs> identified a great potential in this very nebulous cloud of uh, international business. So I think you really the sky is the limit for you. There's so many different opportunities and different occupations that one can think of that are connected to business mm -hmm. and especially international business. So That's good for you. So the you problem is you were only 12 months though. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but it wouldn't restrict me in the way of maybe they would pick on the international that I would have to, um, to make something. Well, you know, conceivably, I'll put it to you this way. Conceivably, any business we do could have international ramifications. And who's to say that working locally, even for a local business in Akron, Ohio, that has not a single client outside the state of Ohio, okay, is, doesn't still have international ramifications because potentially your hiring by that company could open the door for them to send products to, what's your home country if I may ask? Portugal. Portugal. May say open the door to send home uh, sorry, products to Portugal. Mm -hmm. Okay, who's to say it's not going to be related to it? So I think it's a very, very open issue there. I don't see, uh, I don't see uh, uh, USCIS going down that detail. In your training plan, the form I 983, 983, it asks how your degree is going to be linked to your job and what the employer has to do. Uh, I'm going to finish the sentence real quick. Okay. And, 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 and because of that, the employer will have to say, yeah, we are going to do we're providing training. That's all it is. It's it doesn't say that you have to actually apply your degree in the business. It's training in your field. June, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, that's okay. No, I was just going to mention, if she's not eligible for STEM, I-983 is not. Oh, that, that's true. Why am I even saying yeah. I-983? Because you're not even a STEM student. Correct. Mm -hmm. I-983 comes only after the first 12 months. Uh, thank you. Thank you for correcting me, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question. So suppose you do set up your own business for 12 months, and then you decide to leave and go to another after that, is it okay to run it from somewhere else? Absolutely. Like, I don't want to live in Absolutely. 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 Okay. The business set up, the, that's one of the beauties of having a, a business. A business is a legal entity on its own. Mm -hmm. so it it exists matter. without your presence. You don't have to be there to turn on the light and turn it off every day. Okay. You have a virtual business. Or you could hire a manager in the US mm -hmm. and you could go back to wherever you're from. Okay. So you them to send it to a check. Send a check every week. That's fine. <laughs> that works. Works for me. No one's doing it for me, though, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes more. Well, I'm here. I'm a phone call away. I'm an email away if you need any help. I know Emily is just as responsible. So is June. I've heard great things about them from students who come to my office. And uh, we've got some very good talent right here at OIP. So make use of this talent right here. Make use of Nick back there uh, and his associate in the corner there who are going to help you with UARF funded uh, free, free services, okay? So make use of that, all right? Everybody uh, got a pen? Everybody got a card? Splendid. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye now.